get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of Einstein Bagels, RX Bars, P90X, and many more. I wish John Wooden was still around so I could talk to him and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, you know, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, anyone working with clients one-on-one, stop just trading time for dollars and shift from one-to-one client work to -to one-to-many client work. You can go to rise25.com. There is a free dream product ladder which helps you plan out your business on one sheet of paper and see untapped revenue potential, which is interesting. And companies like Disney, Apple, the sporting industry, they all use versions of the product ladder. Uh, I'm really excited. Today we have Jeff Moore, president of International Pacific Seafoods, which is a specialty importer of premium quality chef-ready frozen seafood to the food service and retail segments. Jeff has led the company expansion from 11 million to over 30 million in the past few decades. He knows a thing or two about business. They have customers such as Cheesecake Factory, BJ's Restaurants, House of Blues, and many others. We're gonna talk about everything, Jeff. Entrepreneurship, kids in entrepreneurship. There's so many lessons that I love when you talk about this. So first of all, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate this it. Is, this is really cool. It's an honor. And I got to tell you that just the energy that you have and what you do is is really inspiring. Oh, so I, thank I, you. it's great to be here. That means a lot because you surround yourself with some of the best of the best, uh, I consider. And, um, you know, I have to start off with this, Jeff, because, you know, this urban legend that you have questions on the back of your card. And this, <laughs> yeah. these five questions have saved your customers millions and millions of dollars. So it's like over it's over like like thirty five million dollars. Thirty five million dollars, right. Yeah. I almost want to keep it a secret, like you know, true copywriting, we just open the loop and then yeah. just don't talk about it to the end, but I, I really can't wait, so I had to just ask it up front. Right. Uh, you know, first of all, it's funny because you know so many people were telling me, Oh, you should trademark this, you should do you know it's literally the five questions that anybody that's really doing their job in really any industry, um, they are the questions that help you gain greater insight to what you're doing to be able to provide a true sustainable solution, you know, and, and demonstrative solution. And it's very simple. Um, if I may, I'll just tell you really yeah, quickly what they ahead. are. Tell it's me like, what they are. Because I know people, really, and, like high-level people have seen this, admired it, and asked you, if they could do it, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. That was. Uh, well, I'll tell that story in a second. But yeah. it's. It's. These are the. These are. You're going to almost discount them because they're so simple. But hey, John the Wooden, the this, fundamentals, right? Right. Yeah. Let's let's learn how to put our sock on right now. Amen. And then tire yeah. <laughs> so. Um, and and yeah, don't even get me started. I'm I'm such a freak for socks and shoes that it's like my wife's like stop. Um, the, uh, uh, if anyone hasn't read Wooden by John Wooden, oh, that's, what yeah. we're, that's what we're referring to right now. So, I mean, world class. Even Tony Robbins did an interview with him in the, the original Power Talk series that I, have to check I could that listen out. to every day. Mm. Every day. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Mm. Um, and, but anyway, um, going back to these questions, they're, they're very simple, but let me just give you the stats on them. Yeah. Uh, about 73% of the time when we ask these questions of, of the customer, uh, and when I talk about the customer, I'm talking about the operator, uh, the food service operator, the restaurant owner, the chef, um, those people, people that the end, you call them the end user, yeah. right? It's not the distributor per se, but it doesn't matter. Right. Um, we, 73% of the time when we ask these questions their entirety, the customer's not using the best available option for their application. And over the last eight years now, um, we've saved the restaurant operator in upwards of like over four and a half million dollars a year wow. in food cost, and so like thirty-five million dollars uh, collectively. And that's huge for you know a restaurant. I mean, they have, there's so many hard costs, and the the margins get cut down. Right. So that that's really big. For them. <clears throat> yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the uh, 
and so they're they're really basic, but uh, but they they get us there in hyperspeed. And it is, you know, what are you using now? And it's not just like oh, I'm using halibut. It's like okay, well, where are you getting? The, you know, what what's the origin? You know, what's the cut? Can I see the label? Can I see the product? I mean, it's really getting. You know, I want detail. I don't want just a. I think so. And there's a there's a secret behind this too. The next question, by far, the most important important question is what are you doing with it okay so um you know these these questions where it's like what are you doing with it is how are you menuing it are you how are you preparing it are you trimming it how are you cooking it what you know how, what are you charging for it you know all of these different things yeah and then how much of it are you using and when we say how much of it are you using in seafood um, seafood is generally, especially wild seafood, it's the last hunted food of man. So it's not like if, if all of a sudden there's a short, shortage, short, shortage in the market and something is maybe only has the capacity of doing 10,000 pounds a month of volume and somebody you're talking to does 50,000 pounds a month, we're not talking about a sustainable solution at this point. Right. So that's, that's very important. Okay? But it also helps you qualify this type of customer as well. And then where are you getting the product? What distributor are you getting it from? Are you going and picking it up somewhere? Are you doing this? And this, because I'm an expert in the marketplace, I'm able to take this particular information, these four questions, and kind of bring them all together and understand this this customer's quality threshold, you know, what their really their background and their understanding of this this particular segment or seafood or fish or menu item as a whole. Uh, and then lastly, we ask them, hey, what are you paying for it? You know, if you don't ask, they, they won't tell you. But there's a lot of cases in seafood where somebody's saying, hey, I'm using this particular fish, call it a snapper, and I'm paying $2 a pound for it. You're like, that's not real snapper. You know, you're, you're able to really kind of ascertain some of this. But the beauty of this is none of these questions have anything to do with seafood. And these are questions, what are you doing now? What are you doing with what you're doing now? You know, mm-hmm. what, are you, what are you using now? What you, all of these things can be actually re, repurposed in any industry and even in food for me back in 2013 2014 I got a phone call 2013 I got a phone call from the certified Angus beef conference saying we want you to be our final keynote speaker I'm like well I'm a seafood guy and they go yeah we think that that's just different enough but we want you to talk about the questions hmm and it was funny because I went and did this presentation they paid for me everything I mean I literally had not any idea of what to charge for speaking, you know, how this even works. I didn't have a contract. I didn't have anything. I'm just like, yeah, I'm $2,000 a presentation or something like that. I just made it up, right? And I've, like, probably totally left money on the table. They <laughs> like flew we me would across have paid you 20000 right? Yeah. They flew me across the country. They put me up at the Hilton Head, and, and, you know, everything was great, and it was a great experience. But the months following, literally after the presentation, I was standing next to the – stage with a stack of my business cards because I knew that these meat specialists were going to say like I need those questions I need those questions I started getting mail and photos and things of these meat guys that literally changed the back of their business card and put Mm -hmm. that on there and it's funny we talk about different industries and high profile people I showed that card to David Baca several years ago and David Bach is this you know multi New York Times bestselling author, the Finish Rich series, super guy. Very I mean, well known, such yeah. a sweet guy. Sweet. I mean, to to just he's so just authentic and and gracious. He was just such a wonderful guy, and still is. And um, I showed him the cards, and he looks at the card on the back, and he's like, "That's genius." And I'm like, "Well, I'm not." quite sure i'd call it that but it's it helps me remember the questions <laughs> it's a you know sheet. yeah it's a cheat sheet, a exactly. sheet. and he goes can i use question he goes i have seven questions i ask every one of my clients and i said cool he goes can i put my questions on the back of the card and i'm like okay what have you said no. you know <laughs> polish is like polish joe polish is like you should have licensed that to him i was just like whatever man i just uh, that's joe but uh, anyway but yeah it's so people use you know use these questions i'm sure you have questions when you're doing any type of consultation or you're talking to a sponsor about you know hey what is it you know what what does success look like you know and that's really what we're asking what does success look like here you know, but we're breaking it down into those questions, those core questions. And so that's really the impetus of those questions. Um, uh, I will say back to Joe Polish, 
when I joined in, and started working with the people at Piranha Marketing and you know, Genius Network, uh, when I was putting those questions back together several, several years ago, I did call over there and I said, hey, can you guys help me? maybe word some of this stuff and, you know, and, and position this. And, and we, we really did some, some wordsmithing. It's not like and, you slapped a little it bit of on, yeah, it's not like you slapped it on there. You really thought about how to say it. Yeah, I probably did slap them on there, and then I probably changed it <laughs> a dozen times, you know, ready, fire, aim. You know, yes. <laughs> so, Jeff, will you walk me through a real example of, you don't have to name the company or anything, but just when you asked what were some of the answers you got for each. So, when you said, what are you using now? Maybe for one of your products even. I don't know. What, what's the best-selling product that you have, would you say? Uh, you know, whether it's ahi tuna mm -hmm. or we, – we actually, we're, you know, we're a specialty importer, but we're also a custom processor. And so mm -hmm. we have a cutting facility uh, uh, in, in Brea, California, where we custom cut. And, you know, we've done that where – I remember, God, this is a bunch of years ago. This has to be 15 years ago with Cheesecake Factory. Mm. And Cheesecake Factory didn't have fish and chips on the menu at the time. And, and I had such a great relationship with those people and still do and just love them to death. And we just have a lot of fun. They, they, they're culinary guys. Kix Nystrom is, is uh, the vice president of culinary operations. And when the two of us get together in the culinary center there, it is like – watching professional wrestling you know <laughs> it's just it's just so fun and uh um but uh but we they are very very serious and the most successful restaurant chain in rest in the food service business yeah um they uh but i remember getting a phone call from one of the assistants going like whispering like jeff you gotta get over here and i'm like what's going on you know it's getting over there it's like two and a half hour drive i go what's going on she goes they're looking at cod for fish and chips and they're thinking about cutting it in the back of the restaurant. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, they're, they're just, they use, I think they use, I would say, I want to say it's like 50,000 pounds a month. And so cutting wow. 50,000 pounds a month into one and a half ounce portions is a lot of, a lot of cuts, a lot of knife cuts. And then you don't really want that many knife cuts in the back of the restaurant. And so we went over and we showed them a product. We went through, we, we you know, measured out. We looked at the product. So that's product, like, what are you uh, using price. now? And they would say, cut. Yeah. And yeah. What, and then we'd say, what are you doing with it? Yeah. You know, and so they were like cutting it. So we actually showed them a portion, a cod portion. Um, and we've gone through many different iterations of that product uh, from many different origins. And we're always working. It's always an evolution hmm. of looking to way to improve it in one way or another. But we went and, and did that particular deal. That was from, you know, before they even had somebody distributing it to them or anything like that. And we put that deal together and I'm, I'm sure that, you know, it saved a lot in the fact that they didn't have a lot of cuts that weren't the things that they wanted. But that was one in particular that happened a long time ago, and we've, we've maintained that business. A lot of things when we do from the R&D state, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, because we continue to evolve with our customers and, and know that what was acceptable yesterday you know, is something that is a challenge for us today, uh, meaning we want to we see how much we can make it better. Uh, I will just say that, that uh, those types of things that we do with our customers, we've had – almost a 100% retention rate and not just a 100% retention rate for a year or two, but like in particular, you know, things with, that we've done with Cheesecake Factory have gone on now. It's a 2017, like 18 years, you know, we've, we've maintained that, that relationship and, and, um, you know, and, and that's very similar with a lot of other restaurant chains like we, and, and customers that we have. I, I, I'm a big fan of, business friends i think that i i really i know that having a business friend is not a rite of passage but it's a sincere obligation to serve more and so when you are um you know when you've got that friend you know there's a lot of stakes in it you know and when people go oh, it's not personal it's only business you know what bs man it is personal to me because these are personal friends of mine and, and right. i take everything personally with that yeah. so yeah, I remember, I think Steve Sims, I don't know if you know Steve, uh, posted on Facebook something about that. Like, There's Ah, this party. that's hilarious. Steve, oh. Steve Sims and I, uh, we are very, very good friends. Yeah, so he posted something, like the exact statement on Facebook maybe a few days ago and saying something like, that's crazy. 
you know, if yeah. it's, you know, about that, if it's personal, not business, what is it then type of thing? So. Yeah. And Steve and I are, are, are yeah, uh, we're very close. Uh, we talk regularly. I'll be at his uh, book launch party on Monday. Cool. Uh, honored to be part of that. But he's just, uh, he and I have a have a great time together. We'll give a plug for together. Blue Fishing, so you can link that up in the show notes. Blue yeah, Fishing. Hey, hell yeah! Yes. I bought twenty. I bought twenty <laughs> copies. I'm like, you better sign every one of those. Damn it. <laughs> um, how have you seen people apply that outside the food industry? Um, so, what are you using now? What what uh, industries outside of food have you seen use some of these these questions? Well, I I mean another very good friend of mine. Uh, uh, well, and his daughter, who's even a better friend of mine, is Jay Abraham and Michelle Abraham. And I was you know, just he with is Ridge, the master Ridge of Abraham this past week. You were where? With Ridge. You what? With Ridge Abraham. Oh, you were this past week. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I know Ridge. Yeah. I know Ridge. I know Sage. You know, I know the uh, know the boys, man. Jordan, all those guys. So, uh, uh, and so, um, he's the master of the Socratic method. And so, in consulting, right? Uh, I think that there's there's a thing I call value, but I spell it V A L Y O U, mm-hmm. and it's this is this process, right? And the process of value, how it's spelled, is that we're asking these questions to give us greater insight for better questions. And so, consultants, you know, consultative selling, which is the only way to sell for me. Um, and for I really think for anybody uh, is because that's what it is. Um, there's a lot of people that take those questions and and use those to prep prepare the pounce, if you will. Mm. I'm gonna get these questions answered. And I'm gonna make my offer, and it's like, okay, hey, more offers, more sales. That, that's 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 proven. But what I'm saying is, there's probably five more questions, and that's the thing is no matter what this is, when we're talking about seafood, we're talking about food, we're talking about David Bach with his seven questions, we're talking about anybody that's talking about the questions and saying, why in the hell would he put his seven, his five questions or his seven questions, you know, from David Bach on the back of his card for everybody to use? Because nobody knows the next five questions. Hmm. Nobody knows how those first five questions are setting up the next five questions. And then what we do with those questions after that. You know, and so, so um, in in really any industry, in any conversation, you know, it's funny. My sales guys are the people in my company. We were just talking about this at lunch. My brother, who runs the meat company uh, that that bought us, um, he, uh, we were talking about our patterns of engagement, hmm. and it's like, hey, you know, how how long have you, you know, hey, what are you doing? How long have you been doing this? Oh, I've been doing it a couple of years. Well, what were you doing before that? And it's almost it's habitual for me because I really truly want to know. Hmm. And he started asking, "Well, how do you quantifiably use that?" And I said, "The more familiar you are with the person, the more familiar you are with their decision making process. Mm-hmm. The more you can really truly be that value added producer for them. The, the the person that they go, man, this person really gets me, hmm. right? Because think about it. Those questions, that process." In any situation, in any conversation, you know, it's here's here's a big long quote, right? When you can articulate a person's needs, desires, challenges, fears, and aspirations better than they can, not better than they can to you, but better than they can to themselves, you've now passed that tipping point of becoming this person's trusted advisor. And now you just maintain that type of engagement and conversation with them. And you'll be their trusted advisor for life. And that's like paraphrasing a long thing that Wyatt Woodsmall said a long time ago or paraphrasing the way Evan Pagan paraphrased Wyatt Woodsmall a long time ago or whatever. But that really has been the basis of what these questions have all been about. And honestly, um, you talk about what other industry, the real questions, these questions came from an understanding where we are in the supply chain and how do we take this you know, upstream to downstream and all this they all came from Chet Holmes. They were all inspired from these guys, these people that I've met in my life, and literally driving down the road and listening to Chet Holmes say something and just be like, hey, I'm like five miles from my office. I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to spend the next three hours on a whiteboard. Hmm. 
And that's really where these questions came from. Yeah. You know, so it's any industry, you know, whether it's banking, whether it's, you know, any uh, – uh, building a house for somebody you know i mean all of these questions if you could look at them and break them apart they're all the same questions that you really should be asking yeah jeff i know um i think you consider jay abraham one of your mentors i'm curious yeah. what else you have learned that's been impactful from from jay to you oh man um you know i think that uh, there's, there's conversations that have happened late at night, you know, where we're sitting, we're sitting at the uh, dining room table right off the kitchen, right off the, you know, the outer deck of their house. Um, it's late at night. We're finishing off this last bottle of wine, and the only light that's lit in the house is this one that's over the table, and we're talking in hushed tones, and and Jay Abraham, Jay will say to me, he goes, you know, after all these years and all the successes I had, I really wish I would have done some things differently. Hmm. And then he would tell me. And? <laughs> oh, you think I'm going to share that with you? <laughs> I think that, I think that uh, what Jay teaches a yeah. lot is that you see in in joint ventures and getting equity in companies and things. Um, I think that those, those are truly the things that he wishes he did more of. Hmm. Um, he's done a lot of that and he's been very, very successful. And, you know, um, with, with one and a half arms t tied behind his back, he's earning money even today that, that, you know, people would, it would be life changing and life altering. Uh, you know, so he's he's doing very well. But I think that some of the things that he's taught me, um, you know, he if you truly believe that you have value, then your offer should not be anything but your it should not exude anything but your true belief and your value. You know, he says that if what you what you have if what you have is truly uh, valuable to you, if what you think you have is truly valuable to your client. You have a moral obligation to serve them in every way possible. And there's been some times where I've made offers or I've, I've made presentations to some people and I, I will send him over the presentation and he's anything but gentle in his, <laughs> um, his feedback. Yeah. And he just, I think that, you know, for me, the thing that, that, uh, that I learned from him is that there is definitely a, a subtle difference between confidence in, in being conceited or arrogance, um, but to never ever allow your belief in yourself to subside, especially in the face of somebody that you're working with and, and looking to make an offer to. And he's, you know, and that to me is the one that I'll never forget. I mean, shit, the, the feedback he gave me on this one particular subject was like, holy crap, like, he just kicked my ass for, and he doesn't like to type because his hands are all messed up. But he he spent some time typing this thing out and beat the living crap out of me. And so, what was it about the offer? He just felt like I was being too um, soft, too cagey, too. You know, I understand that this is your situation, but this is my situation. You know, it was just it was just something where he just said you needed to be way more matter of fact. And well, actually, that offer. And the way I positioned the offer at the time that I positioned the offer absolutely crashed and burned, and it, it didn't work. Six months later, when I went back into the same meeting, those people knew that I meant business, hmm. and it was and everything turned out to be. I got exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, but it was. Uh, but he, you know, he was just like, look, I don't, I don't like the fact that if you, you know, that you're trying to be too. I forget the word he was saying, but it was it was one of Jay's words, right? And it was just he was uh, God. I can't. It, it's right on the tip of my tongue, and it's it's easily got three syllables, if not four. <laughs> but it, but it was uh, it was it was one of those words, and I, I remember I had to look it up, and then I was like, oh, that hurts even worse. But uh, but it was just one of those things where I was, I was actually positioning myself in, in an offer of my services and. and recognizing where a company was in their in their life cycle and he didn't like the fact that i was uh 
Yeah. That that placating, if you will. I feel like mentors is, mentors are so important. Live mentors or maybe it's books or other things to keep our head on straight. Are there any particular would, ones yeah. that yeah, what are there any particular ones you go to year after year or in the past or yeah. some of your favorite? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, one of my mentors, a guy that I just think the world of, is Jamie Smart. Um, with the book, he wrote the book Clarity. Um, and I am, if 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 not just a huge fan, an more an enormous evangelist for what he does. And um, you know, we've had Jamie and I have spoken on the phone. I mean, it like literally manifested out of thin air. I was in, visiting my son in Wisconsin, and I got a text. And I look at the text, it's like, hey, Jeff, it's Jamie Smart. I'm going on a long walk, and I'd love to talk to you. Hmm. Never met the man before in my life. I was just like, holy shit. Yeah. So, you know, but uh, he's, a, he's a guy I always go to. Um, I will tell you some of, the, some of the greatest stuff that I've listened to ever and, and literally um, – wanted to would would it was it was a, a cd set and so i was only listening to it in my car and if i could if it, it almost made me want to drive another thousand miles just I so love i could continue ones. listening to it yeah and that would be gary, gary halbert's triple x uh where in 1997 they're sitting in a hotel room in denver with joe polish john carlton gary halbert and a couple, I can't remember the lady's name, who's like superstar. Like they were all direct response, just, you know, massive world-class experts. And it's just my favorite part is when Gary Halbert just beats the shit out of Joe. But, but uh, uh, you know, it was, it was one of those where I listen to that and you can take those things. I, I really like listening to how people have been successful implementing or some some kind of an innovation that's scalable and i always think that true innovation comes from something outside your industry yeah and and then you know those are the add-on innovations and, and but the but the greatest innovations are um things where you take take things away you know hmm. and you, you you subtract and and so uh there i can't remember that book but uh, i listen to that every once in a while um one of the other ones that I listened to, and the first time I listened to it, this guy was so together and and so inspiring and just everything so good that I actually had a negative response about mm, it. And I was like, F, F that guy. You know, who does he think he is? And it's Dean Jackson. Hmm. Uh, Dean Jackson is still, I mean, he's the mentor's mentor. Uh, but uh, you know what? I got to tell you, Jeremy, I, I have this thing called Thursday Night Boardroom. And it's a mastermind group that I started with four people. Um, and now it's got, you know, we're, I think there's close to 700 people in 24 countries mm-hmm. and interact on Facebook. And then once a month we all meet, well, not all of us, of course, but the people we meet in person. And so people that have come through that door, uh, guys like Vince Reed, Aaron Fletcher, um, it's just, I mean, it, it just keeps going on and on and on. Esther Kish, uh, people that have just shown up and have become, we've become dear friends. Uh, they're mentors to me. I, I, you know, I look for a collaboration. Uh, Thursday night boardroom is literally like your own personal board of advisors that you can come in there and, and, you know, people that you've never heard of are in there that you're like, man, I really got a lot from this person. I'm really inspired by them. But that conversation the collaboration with multiple people. Wisdom comes from multiple, you know, perspectives, and I think that some of that has been the most inspiring. I think that I'm inspired by my wife, you know, and I think that she, in her way, mentors me. I think my best friend that I was talking to you about before in Chicago, you know, he's a great mentor of mine. I just, I, I, I don't know if it's I have a world full of mentors, but I certainly have a vast network i mean steve sims you know a vast network of friends that i admire and i trust and i seek their advice and so you know i don't know if that's a mentor yeah. relationship yeah i, for I really sure don't yeah you know and so it's just it's it's uh, 
you know, and, and I mean, there's just, I mean, when people ask me that question, it's literally like I've taken this scribe or a scroll and it's just like rolling in front of me, like the end of a movie. Yeah. It's just like these people that are in my life. And yeah. you know, I've got one friend, Dennis, who has a multi-million dollar law practice and he works four hours a day. You know, it's right. like, are you kidding me? 20 hours a week, multi-million dollar practice has a winery in his backyard in Fullerton, California, you know, just lives life to the fullest. And just, you know, if that's not a guy that can inspire you or, or, you know, mentor you in some things and you have the ability to pick up the phone and just say, Hey, I need some help. Yeah. You know, that to me, my cup runneth over on that one, man. I can yeah. pick up the phone. I feel I can call anybody. My speed dial is just insane. Yeah. You know, it's a, I'd, I'd be envious of my speed dial 10 years ago. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing now, those, I'm just hugely, Jeff. I'm hugely yeah. grateful. You know? Yeah. Thank you for sharing those. I'm always looking for other distant mentors, whether it's a book or a CD or whatever it is. Also, um, and that, you know, what I'm really curious about, and, and I've heard you talk about in the past, is, you know, entrepreneurship with, with kids. So I'm curious, oh, yeah. one, for you, what was it like for you growing up? And I know you, for your kids, you infused this entrepreneurship piece. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, before I even knew what the hell an entrepreneur was, I knew what a sales pro was. Mm. And my dad was a, was, a, was a well-known executive in the food service industry. My grandfather was a giant in retail and the beverage industry, mm. was literally selling a guy a tie uh, in the late 30s, was given the Pepsi-Cola bottling franchise for Orange County. I mean, talk about a sales call, you know. <laughs> um, and he literally started, you know, it's kind of funny, this the five questions. He had a thing that, that the retail grocers association had the sales and marketing committee or whatever they called it. And he was the president of that for a long time. Your grandfather. Yeah. yeah. And he had this thing called the five star sales approach, hmm. like literally the boards up there and, and you know, the, 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 the star with the points of the star and then there's stars. I mean the old fashioned easel. I mean, this sits in his office at his house and he's literally teaching me this as he's like 90 years old. You wow. know? And, and, uh, yeah, and I remember selling like in second grade, I'm selling candles for the school, right? A fundraiser. And my dad's like, so what do you got? And I open up the, the box of candles and I turn it like this. He goes, Hey, what are you doing? I go, I'm reading the box, reading the, what they are. And he goes, you put that box in your lap and you open that up and I want you to read it upside down. He goes, you'll never be a great salesperson until you learn how to read upside down. And so I was like, oh, cool. So I started reading upside down like really early on. And it's so funny because I keep going back to my friend in Chicago, but he was uh, one of the VPs of purchasing at the, a distributor that I'd sell to. And he knew that I knew how to read upside down and I'd walk into his office and he'd literally jump on his desk. He's like, get out. I haven't turned all my papers over yet. Get out. You know, I was just like, oh my God. So I think that's yeah, the title so, of your next book. Get out. Read upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Not my first book, maybe. Right. Yeah. But the, uh, um, the, uh, just door to door selling when I was in seventh grade. Wow. I was making like 300 bucks a week. What were you selling? Selling door -door? lawn aeration. That's another mentor of mine, Doug Yunkin. I mean, this guy's like my bigger brother and just an extraordinary. He was, he was the first entrepreneur I ever knew. Junior in high school, pulling down 10 grand a month. Wow. In the 70s. You know, and, and during the summer, selling lawn aeration, which is loosening up the soil. We have a lot of that in, you know, problem in California with Adobe base and things and and i remember it was lawn it's orange county lawn services and he'd teach me and he, he would he would get everybody inspired about making money and he had all these methods and strategies that he'd do and and tricks and he would hire these kids and drive them around i mean no there's no way this happens in today's world but drive these kids around drop them off in a neighborhood and say go sell you know <laughs> and and it was like, you know, you'd knock on the door and it's like, hi, my name is Jeff Moore. I'm with Orange County Lawn Services. And next week we're going to be in your neighborhood offering a super low discount price on lawn aeration. Are you familiar with what lawn aeration is? And then we'd talk about pulling the core, the adobe base, and pulling the core out to loosen up the soil. And then we'd have 
the, the, the fertilizer that has ammoniacal nitrogen in it that was a time release nitrogen and we would and can you imagine you're sitting this there is and great. a seventh grader a seventh grader you're yeah. an adult you own this home and a seventh grader's rocking this thing you're just buying it because he just he just right. rocked it's- his head, right and so we do that and I mean I was I was pulling down some good money and then and then uh um uh I got to go work with him and and, and uh, uh, do the work with him during. So I made more money doing that. And then the next summer, I screwed it up because I was a little bit arrogant. Now I'm in eighth grade, and he had some one of his friends running the business. And his friend got out of the car to use the bathroom at the the gas station. I ended up stealing the car with all the kids. You in stole it. the car. Oh my God! I got the crap knocked out of me. This guy was also a state champion wrestler. He just beat not the someone hell. to mess with. Yeah, so you know, I I, I, I was a great salesman. I didn't say I was rich, uh, you know mature, <laughs> but you know the the question thing though rolls back around where I got into food service and I was understood food service, and man, when I got into food service and I was in sales, I forgot everything about selling. And I would literally just be like, let my passion be my guide, and I'm going to show these people this, and I'm going to show them that, and I'm, you know, I'm going to learn on the fly. And I remember this one sales manager went with me one day, and he goes, what in the hell was that? And what do you mean? He goes, you don't even read. The guy's got his arms folded. He's just kind of single-syllable answers. He goes, do you even know anything about selling? I'm like, what the hell are you talking to, pal? I've been reading upside down since I've been in second grade. I know how to sell. You know? And all of a sudden, I step back and I'm like, you know what? It is about learning, being being more of a student of the game. And I remember this back in 1990, 1989, 1990. I became a student and in, in, in enrolled in Windshield University. And Nightingale Conant, you talk about mentors. Windshield University, yeah. Holy crap, man! I mean, you know, Earl Nightingale and Lead the Field and Acres of Diamonds. I mean. I'm driving all over Southern California, hours a day, hundreds of miles a day, and I have I'm burning through cassettes. You know, I mean, it it, it was the point where I think Nightingale Conant would just send it to me, knowing that I'd end up paying for it after a while. You know, it was I was listening to everything. Sound Selling Magazine was my bible back then. So it was just yeah, selling selling was was great. But the thing about the kids, and you roll into the kids, and sorry for that divergence. No, there. I keep going. Um, yeah. Hardcore I, sales training from a very young age. You know? <laughs> it is. Excuse me again. Um, I when I learn something, and I've got the saying says, "Learn to teach, teach to know, know and share, and share with passion." When I'm learning something, I'm not just going, "Okay, yeah, cool. I'm taking some notes or whatever." I'm literally crafting what I'm going to say to the person that I'm going to teach this to mm. as I'm learning. And my kids, like if there's something that really resonates as not only great business lesson, but a great life lesson, that, that is my kid that it's like, okay, you guys are going to listen to this. So Tony Robbins was always on in the car with the kids, right? Um, Darren Hardy, Jim Rohn, always on in the car. Uh, when, when Darren Hardy, I remember being on the webinar, the cook would never even a webinar. It was a tele seminar or something like that. When Darren Hardy was was launching um, Compound Effect, and Chet Holmes gave him his audience, and Darren Hardy didn't know what that was going to do, right? This is, I mean, all these guys that have these glorious lives and these grand, you know, plans and everything like that. Within 20 minutes of this teleseminar starting, Darren Hardy blew out of every book he had. Wow! And I was like, wow. So Compound Effect, this is the real deal. And so I got the Compound Effect in hard copy. I got it in or in hardback, I got it in softback, I got it in audio, I got it every way I could get it. And I went through that. And that was the first time I went, you know what? It's time to time to put the kids to work. And I said, guys, here's your book. Oh, I want to read a book. <laughs> read this book. You give me back your you give me back your top takeaways per chapter. And I'll give you a hundred dollars. Like, whoa. So my this guy second business, daughter, yeah, yeah. My second oldest daughter, she just cranked it out. She's like she, she's a big fitness person now. But uh, you have she, four kids, right? She, yeah, four yeah. kids. All started with A, the letter A. Addison, Ashley, Austin, and Allie. And uh, and actually, three of those kids now are in the top ten of the uh, AP 
top 25 football. We got Alabama, Penn State, and Wisconsin, and then did you go to your Oregon, son went to Madison? Oregon somewhere down there. What? Your son went to Madison, or yeah, he's there now. Yeah, that's where I went. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. He just he just called me, so you might know this, right? He just called me as I'm driving over here. And he goes, Dad. He's all excited. I go, What? He goes, I got a job. And I go, Cool. I go, you got a couple jobs. You're like a Jamaican there, buddy. And he goes, he goes, no, Dad, this is the one. I go, okay, because I'm paying him 15 bucks an hour to help me with stuff remotely. And he go, I go, how much you making? He goes, 10 bucks an hour. I go, oh, okay. He goes, but I get all the discounts. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, I get tons of discounts. He goes, I'm a cook at the W. Now, nice, yes. The w, you know where the W I, is? I worked at a sub shop in Madison when I went to school there because I get the discounts. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So he said W's like the the, the, the college like yeah. the great, you know, beer and food and, and he cooks best. like nobody's business because we've grown up in that business, but yeah, he's so excited about it. So he's yeah, so he's at Wisconsin. So you're a badger, cool. so you're real proud of your team right I now am. too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah, so so yeah, so it so started with that hundred bucks and they one of your daughters devoured it. Yeah, like. she yeah. she devoured it. My son read it. Uh, and then just the other ones the, the older one was, she's just like kind of had her way of doing things. She's, she's smart on her own, but she works for a company called tap pad out of, uh, New York. It's one of those, you know, the, uh, big brother, we're following you on every, you know, every platform you have and we make offers to you. She was, she was, uh, with the, the trade desk before they went public. And so she was there when they wow. went public. So she's done stuff, but they're all, you know, they've, they've all grown up. They understand that, that, uh, to follow what they truly love. And, and so, but entrepreneurship, I don't know if it's necessarily as much entrepreneurship as work ethic and self-sufficiency. Hmm. Um, the one that's at, the one that's at Penn state, she's the youngest and she's the smartest of all of us. You know, my wife's a uh, college prep counselor, has been for 27 years. She now has her private practice, the collegepreproadmap.com. There's right. a plug. Yeah, and link that up. My youngest, my youngest watched what she did, listened to what she said, and started making her relationships with the people in the in the d- departments that she wanted to be in. Very smart, yeah. Like for her junior year. And so she's there now. She went to Penn State because she wanted to go to a school that had a really, really high performing, you know, recognized school newspaper. And she's now, I think this, she's just finishing her second article. She's only been there for a little over a month. She's finishing her second article. She's been published already in this wow. newspaper. I mean, she's doing, so I think that all of my kids really understood kind of the, the core tenets of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we, there's no way that through osmosis they didn't get it. But I, I even started a little mastermind group called Parthenon uh, that was when, the, when my son was in uh, eighth grade. And we all met. And the first thing we watched was Darren Hardy talking about the eight extraordinary insights of today's super achievers. We went through the, we went through the compound effect. We did those things. I even had my kids read Think and Grow Rich, but... Good Lord, you know, I mean, it's it's written, it's, it, it was one of the original copies, so it's written in that kind of old English, like, what's this mean type thing, but uh, but they really jumped in on that, um, and I think that personal development is probably more, you know, it, it's probably a, a, a broader sense of what they, they were taught, um, yeah. and then I think that, you know, and, and I'm serious when I say this, I think that my kids learned a lot from the mistakes I've made too. Like I think what? that's probably been just as far as uh, you know, money, uh, you know, overextending yourself, uh, uh, buying too big a house, or you know, that that type of move. I think that my kids have learned to be relatively frugal. My wife, you know. Uh, for very few exceptions, throws nickels around like they're manhole covers. I mean, she is as cheap and frugal as they get. And I think that they've seen that. You know, I think that they've seen the way it feels to not have enough money. And so all of them are, they're workers. Yeah. They work. And so I think that, uh, uh, and they're always looking for, 
you know, ways to better themselves. So I think that's the thing that I'm most proud of yeah. with them. They just really, yeah. they inspire me. Love they that, Jeff. Me. Um, you know, in the beginning, I always ask about what's top of mind. And one thing that's top of mind for you that I, I want to talk about is incorporating business to consumer concepts to the B2B space and yeah. then how to hyper speed authority and credibility. And and yeah. I don't know if this relates to the wild thing seafood or not. If no, that was an experiment. It did. It did. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you want to talk about the wild things and, and wild things. I don't know how many people are the, your listeners are B two B like corporate B two B brick and mortar guys because it's obviously you know I I love just the whole inspired insider the chi energy that comes from that and I think that there's many walks of life that are listening uh, yeah for sure but I, I just think that um, the wild things deal if you've been in B two B your whole life and you've been kind of in a you know you really like the consultative selling when you get into B two C it's like recess. Everything I had, it was so fun. We did stuff, the gourmet giveaway, where we were giving away like thirty-five dollars worth of free seafood and steak, and and Wild shipping it for free. Just for context, was your business to consumer? It was our business to consumer brand that we were doing. We're doing warehouse sales. We started by doing warehouse sales, just yeah. like hey, come on over, and even that was a ball. I mean, God, I was getting. The things that we were able to do on, with Wild Things, the testing that we did was insane. I mean, the gourmet giveaway, just, hey, performance in advance. Everybody's heard of it, right? And while it was a broken funnel, there was some huge things that could go beyond with it. And so that was a lot of fun. Uh, we, we did a thing where if you were ordering, you got free seafood from me on the gourmet giveaway. I was actually sending you a personal video. Wow. It's like, hey, Jeremy, thanks for ordering the, the, the gourmet giveaway. I just love what you ordered. Let me talk a little bit about what you got. And I would literally talk about, you know, kind of a story about that seafood or that meat or how I prepare it. And then just say, hey, you're going you're gonna to be getting another, you know, you're going to be getting another offer from us over the next few weeks. But what I'd like to do is I'm going to give you some more free seafood, but I want you to actually post when you receive your package. Open it up, send us a video that, you know, put it or post it on Facebook that you received this and encourage people to try us out. I mean, people went nuts for that. I mean, even Dean Jackson's group was like, we, they were just like, you know, God, look at this. This is, we're going to call this the Jeff Moore, I give a crap about you video, right? And Dean's like, this is great, Jeff, but what happens when you get a thousand orders in a day, you know? And so, you know, it was like, okay, you know, we're just, we're testing it out. But things were, I would do these. And it would be Aweber, right? It's like it's these are auto, you know, out to, out to the list. I would craft an email that would that would sound so like I'm talking to you um, in the hushed tones in the back of the the restaurant or the bar. I'm like, dude, I've got this ribeye wagyu ribeye that is like fifty dollars a pound, but this company bought too much of it, and they wanted me to get rid of it. And so I'm going to sell it for $5 a pound. Now, you can get as much as you want, but I promise you if you're not there by 9 o'clock in the morning, it's going to, it's just going to be gone. It is unbelievable. I'll tell you what, if you call our, my, my assistant right now, she'll set some aside for you. Like those are the type of emails that I'd send, right? Dude, within 30 minutes we're sold out. Like four days before the thing even starts. And I would forget to tell my assistant or I'd forget to tell the people in the office that I'm doing those things. And all of a sudden you'd hear this, Jeff, did you send another email like that again? I was like, oh my God. Freezer bags. When people go, hey, do you want to, you know, like just testing stuff again, right? Freezer bag. You buy a freezer bag from us, nine ninety five. We give you a free piece of fish every time you come and shop with that freezer bag. Right. Wow. So people at the at the counter are going, hey, you want to buy a freezer bag? You want to buy a bag? You want to buy a bag? They're like, nah, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm like, stop asking if they want to buy a bag. What do you want? To, what do you want me to ask? Ask if they want to join the free fish of the month club. They're like, what? What? I'm like, trust me, we'd sell out of our bags so fast it wasn't even funny. And then we'd get another shipment in, and I do one of those. Hey, we got some new bags in check them out emails and we'd sell our bags out before like people literally go 
do you have any more bags? Do you have any more? I mean, it was hilarious. We would sell so much stuff like that, but you've got to sell so much of it to offset what you're doing. I mean, between the meat company now and the seafood company, we're doing two and a half million dollars a month, a week. I was doing $40,000 a month in sales and having the time of my life doing it. And so obviously totally distracted from the bigger thing. But I mean, the, the testing and the things that we did in there were so fun and so sticky and just, just a ball and people, the customers, when they would come in, cause I'd be cooking up some awesome food every time we'd have it. They would, I mean, it was truly like people came to a party. And we would sell. We started the first time we sold. We just we weren't cooking up a lot of stuff. Did like three thousand dollars in a day in sales. By the time we ended that deal, we were doing like eighteen thousand wow. in four hours. <laughs> it was insane. It was so fun. So, with the wild thing, seafood, you loved it. It was doing well, but just not as well as the as the other piece. Yeah. And you got some advice though on this, right? Well, the, the, the advice, well, the from, advice from the owner. Yeah, what, yes. That just said, he just said, you know, well, I don't know what your advice you're talking about. Well, the claim, the, owner, the claim jumper founder, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, he was the founder of Claim Jumper, sold it, sold Claim Jumper in 2007 for the highest multiple ever paid for a restaurant chain, ever. Until Portillo, Portillo's was just sold for like oh, 1.1 billion. I didn't know that, wow. ridiculous number. Uh, but, uh, um, he was like, you know what? He goes, this is a lot of fun. I can see what you're doing. He goes, but Jeff, two and a half million a week, 40,000 a month. He goes, if you put the kind of energy that you put into this, into that, he goes, just think about it. And it's a different energy, but that's where I got into that authority model where yeah. it's like, why not write some of those emails? Not, why not write something that's like a deep dive, like a conversation that's super shareable, like not just like, hey, this person learned something, but they're and they're willing to share it. It's so easily read with no jargon that they're eager to share it. Yeah, they're super confident to share it. And so we started the deep dive report just not too long ago, and that authority model in B two B, if and especially if you're an established business, you've got a Rolodex, you know, for you've got a list of names, an, an address book, right? For people that don't know what a Rolodex is anymore, it's like, like, like you say an e-ticket to your kids. At Disney. That's a real e-ticket. They're like a what? It's like, oh, you got to remember, remind them what an e-ticket was at Disneyland. There was the ABC. It's like, never mind. Um, but you got a Rolodex, and so what I did is I took that Rolodex and kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't take this from Ryan Levesque, you know, and he didn't take it from me. And that's whatever. But we all have our own way of getting there. But I have what I call buckets of influence. Right. And so I've got in the supply chain where you go from, you know, the guy that's pulling the fish out of the water to the guy that's receiving that fish off of his boat to the guy that's now the primary processor to the secondary processor import, which is me, to the distributor, you know, to the, you know, to the wholesaler, the distributor, the end user, yeah. they're all the supply chain. Well, within that supply chain, there's buckets of influence. And those buckets of influence have a similar conversation that goes on with it, right? And so I was able to take and take these buckets of influence and not put them and tag them into an AWeber or MailChimp or, or, or an autoresponder like that because a lot of these corporate entities like Cisco and U.S. Foods, they've got these filters that block that shit out, right? But I did, and I went in and I put all of these in Excel spreadsheets and put them into my um, – Google Docs, right? And then I got yet another mail merge, which is the the, the Gmail mail, mail merging system. Right. And I literally, for everything that I do in the deep dive report, I will write an individual email, eight eight emails, wow, eight emails to these people and share that link with them mm. and give them context in that thing, right? Because yeah. context is God. And give them context in this and boy, I'll tell you, if they didn't share that like crazy, and I tested it. The first one I did, I did on Mahi Mahi, and it was called WTH is going on with Mahi Mahi. I mean, for somebody outside the industry, who gives a crap, right? But this inside the industry, but I used those buckets of influence. I let them know that it was being shared on LinkedIn. 
that that article that I put on LinkedIn was viewed over 10,000 times. Wow. The next one I did on the pokey business because the pokey rest of ahi pokey, you know, and winning the pokey war once and for all, which is still a really compelling title if you're in the pokey business, right? But I haven't done the buckets of influence in that yet. It's only been viewed 2,000 times. Mm. So everything's a test. Five times the, yeah. Yeah, everything's a test. And so just being able to watch how that, you know, that works that way and then the next one's going to be on alternative species of seafood and and you know turning turning alternative species into destination dishes in the restaurant you know or just a whole list of things you know one yeah. of them's like you know we talked about taking the knife out of their hands because it, it's hard to control it so that title is drop the knife and step away from the fish you know just like i'm a kind of a cop walking in the back of the kitchen you know and so all yeah. of these and things you infuse like, your sense of humor in there oh yeah. totally yeah Totally. I mean, it's just, uh, um, and when people like I had, you know, Roy Fur by any chance, the, uh, yeah, of course. Case. Yeah. So funny dude, like love the guy full blown nerd though. Right. I mean, he's a sweet he loves guy. His techno music. Have you, he have is, you listened to his, he'll actually mix techno music. I haven't heard that part of it. Okay. But we, I will get on, I literally a car, I'll, I'll rent a car. I've got business to do in Houston, Texas, but then I've got a, a, a conference in San Antonio. And I will literally, as I'm pulling out of Houston, I'll pick up the phone and call Roy Fur, and we're on the phone all the way to San, San Antonio. I mean, it's there, and talk about an awesome conversation. So, right after I posted the thing and put put the uh, the the mahi mahi one out, I get a phone call like a Friday morning early, like I'm just working out. And I go, I'm riding on my bike. I go, oh, you know, I'll get off my bike. I'll talk to Roy. I'll go for a walk. Roy starts telling me about the the dynamics of the way I write. Mm. Which well, you're you're a kind of, serious student of direct response and copywriting. I mean, total, yeah, total, total. And you know what's funny is my mom was a huge inspiration. You know how my mom was a huge inspiration with my writing. What's that? I would I would write. You know, like back in the day, you know, you'd write your report, and then if you had a cool mom, she'd type it for you. And my mom was a mentor teacher, 40 years in, in, in the education. So I'd write, and she'd type. And so I'd be in one room, and she'd be in the other. And every so often, my mom would stop, just like gasp, and just yell out, Jeff! And I'm like, yeah. She goes, you are a moron. <laughs> I was like, she goes, who that's, writes that's this way? That's not where I saw that going. But <laughs> no, me neither, right? Right? So she goes, you are a – I go, she goes, Jeff, you I, – I will not type one more word for you until you stop what you're writing and read what you're writing out loud mm. because what you're sending over to me is literally like the dumbest person in the world. And I was just like, oh. Thanks for boosting my self-esteem, man. Thanks. Oh, yeah. That was, you know, right? My dad won't let me sell him candles unless I can read them upside down. My mom was like, but you know, she's loving it. I mean, obviously, but that just a, a moment that sticks. But but it was, it's yeah, great it's lesson. truly about being, yeah, that's a great about lesson. being that. But, but the, author, the authority thing is, is where you really can hyperspace speed your authority by writing something that has no jargon, that literally says what is like questions again, right? What is going on? What does this mean? Now, there's there's something important here. What does this mean to you? What does this mean? What does this mean to you? And what can you do about it? Right? No jargon. Very purposeful. Right? And now you're putting yourself in that kind of consultative, authoritative position. But here's the real trick to this. I'm writing it to the end user. Right? This is the guy who downstream, this guy, everybody's doing everything upstream to, to please, right? I'm writing it to him, but I'm writing it for one, two, and three people removed from him right. that are still That's ultimately tough. influenced. That's tough to do. Yeah. No, you just still write it to him. Yeah. It's just about taking all the jargon away. Mm. And then in those, remember, in those emails that I send, I provide that context. So somebody goes, ah, oh, I can't wait to read this. Oh my God, I can't wait to share it. <laughs> and that's where this kind of authority model, if you if you can nut up and understand that, hey, 
you know, not everybody's going to read 1,600 to 2,000 words, except the one that cares. Right. And if you write it in a conversational style, you piece it together like that, you use all the structures of single sentences and, you know, fewer words and, you know, less compound sentences, all those different things that, you know, I'm sure I pulled up from Bond Halbert stuff here. Um, you know, it's, it's, that, that stuff really plays in. And I can't believe how fast, how, I mean, aggregators are picking up those articles. I'm like, what the hell? I just started this thing. But my point to that is, is like, you know what? The truth is the truth and the truth is binary. If you know in your heart of hearts that this is going to benefit your business, being the authority is going to benefit your business. There's not a broader truth. Right. Why it's wouldn't it? Yeah. It's the truth. Do it. Yeah. Right? It might not happen now. It might happen in two articles from now. It might not happen ten articles from now. But guess what? Gary Vaynerchuk did a thousand wine library TVs. The first hundred nobody watched. Right. But today, people are watching his stuff. Yeah. Right? He's stuck with it. So Jeff, first of all, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much. This has been this super been valuable, and everyone should check out internationalpacific.com. I don't know where else Where else should we send people to check out. You know, if, if you're in Orange County or you're in Southern California, because we get people that drive from like Indio, Esther will drive from Indio to come here. Uh, people from San Diego um, will, will drive up here. Um, and down from Santa Barbara, uh, you can go to Thursday night boardroom.com. Cool. And, and join, uh, you have to, you have to sign up, you know, it's free. It's always going to be free. Uh, I get people at the end of every one of these sessions coming into me with like a checkbook or a credit card. And I'm like, I don't know what that's for. I, you know, they, buy a bag for the fish, but this is, yeah, free. buy some fish. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, uh, but so it's free, but, it's valuable and it does have a cost and that means you've got to come in and you got to bring it. This is not yeah. going to be your intellectual entertainment yeah. and it's going to be, you got to participate. Painful. Yeah. So, so international pacific.com and Thursday night boardroom, uh, com. And actually what's funny it, if you're like, Hey, well, how do I get a hold of Jeff? Go to international pacific.com and look at one of my articles. I put my email and my freaking cell phone number at the end of every one of those articles that I write. So, and and I know we're at the top of the hour. I just wonder if you have a few minutes to talk about the philanthropic piece. Do you have? Do you have to? I don't know if you have to get on. Yeah, that call, yeah, that no, person, no, I'm, I'm cool calling. with that. Like we were talking but about. But I, I wanted Mike. to hear. I mean, I just don't want to skip over that because I think it's an important piece. Also, yeah. I don't. I I think that you know I grew up with being very active uh, in in a lot of philanthropy. Um, and I just think that the purest sense of community comes through philanthropy and giving. And, um, you know, we've been doing the food for Swim with Mike, which is a fantastic uh, uh, program that, that helps students, uh, college students that are unable to fulfill their obligations for scholarships or even students that might have uh, become injured or ill before they went to college. Mm. Uh, and, but they were superstar athletes and they were on their way to getting a scholarship. Uh, Swim with Mike provides those types of resources for these kids to mm. fulfill the dream of a college education. And, uh, you know, that's something that we're, we're behind uh, big time. Uh, but it's just, it, it never ends. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I uh, to me, you know, I hear so many people, oh, I just want to give back. It's just like, okay i want to just give you know i'm i'm not even sure i'm at that give back part yet i just i just love like like giving and um like i said it's the purest sense of community you know to give of yourself to give of your resources um and so you know i mean that's that's kind of a good point but uh but like swim with mike i mean that that's just to me uh one that's been part of our family for 35 years and now my dad's retired and he, uh, you know, he, he's had a great relationship with Ron Orr, who's the assistant uh, AD over at uh, uh, USC. And even though I'm a Bruin, uh, you know, we're still, you know, here, we're brothers. And uh, uh, he's actually a beta, so I'm a beta. And so we're, we're both, uh, we're, we're truly brothers. But, uh, but 
you know, I have that relationship with Ron Orr, and I'll carry on that tradition if, if for no other reason than to honor my father and honor his wishes. Uh, you know, not that he's dead, but not honor his wishes uh, uh, as we go forward. And so, yeah. you know, philanthropy. I think that everybody, you know, everybody knows what that's that's about. And it's just like again, it's the purest form of community to me. Yeah. Jeff, thank you again. I wish there was a video I could watch your grandfather's five-star sales approach. That would be God, awesome in black me and white too. or something. But uh, thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. This has been fun. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side.